I want to talk to you today about, oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. How many of you ever feel like, I'm not sure if Jesus still loves me. I'm not sure if what I've done, I don't know how he could love me. Because sometimes you think, I don't know how I can love me. Maybe that's probably the, the biggest part right there. Thank you. Thank you that Jesus isn't me. Because he can see past. He loves us. And I want to share that with you today, a scripture uh, found in Exodus, two scriptures. And, and I want to get into that. If you want to turn in your Bibles, it's Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And we're going we're gonna to be right there at that scripture through most of this. If you're a note taker, how many of you got a handout with notes? If you did not get it, raise your hand. We'll make sure you have one. Anyone not? Got some hands up? Uh, Bill's going to get that for you. He knows exactly where they are. Keep your hand up. When Bill comes back in, he'll give it to you. If you're a note taker, you are going to love today. All right? So um, there's going to be a lot of notes. Um, if you like Hebrew, you're going to love today. All right? So uh, just raise your hand up again. Bill's back in. and He'll get those to you. Raise your hand up high if you need those notes. And uh, he'll get them to you. I was so impressed when uh, I was back when I was a kids pastor, uh, man, 20 years ago plus. And um, Christy's uncle, who many of you guys know, he was with us at our missions um, banquet. Ed Nelson, who's secretary of the district here in South Carolina for the Assemblies of God. He is, Ed is a Hebrew scholar. Matter of fact, if you're in a room and we're praying Ed's praying in Hebrew. He just, he's fluent in Hebrew. And I remember he came, I had asked him to come to um, the church we were at in Tampa, Northside Assembly in Tampa, Florida. And uh, we had him come in and actually Ed's, this is how the world works. I mean, just the things work, you know. Um, it's my wife's uncle, we're at this church, and Ed's roommate from Southeastern was a member in our church. So, of course, they got to hang out, but we brought Ed in. And I asked Ed, so what are you going to preach on? He has no notes. He said, I, I'm, I think I'm going to talk about the love of Jesus today. And he just quotes Scripture and stops without looking at notes, and he's breaking every word down by the Hebrew meaning and letting you understand exactly what that Scripture is that you're reading. Oh, I wish I could do that. But I can't, so I'm going to be looking at my notes, all right? So, um, but we're going to break down this scripture. The scripture is, let me give you some context of where this is. Moses has already broken the first tablets. He's back. God has told him to be in the cleft of the rock. He passes by. And as he passes by, that's the end it's the end of chapter uh, 33, 34 starts off with what he's saying to him. And these are the words that God speaks to Moses. He says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the th third and to the fourth generation. The version I'm showing you here is the Hebrew interlinear Bible. We've prayed a little bit today, but... Can we just pray over this just for a moment? Bow your heads. Lord, as we look at your words, Heavenly Father, your words, I pray let us see, let us understand your words in a way maybe we haven't before. I pray, Lord, today that there's someone in this room that has ever thought how could God love me when I can't even love myself? I pray, Lord, today 
let them understand how great your love is and how wonderful you are. We cannot love like you love. We cannot think like you think. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. So today, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to look at this scripture, and, and as we look at this, and the Lord pass by before him and proclaim the Lord, the Lord God. Let's, we're going to break down some of these words. It says, the Lord, Lord. The Lord, the, the, the Hebrew for that one right there is Yahweh. You know that, right? Yahweh. It's the personal name. It's a personal name for God. It, it, it means literally, I am always with you. I'm never away from you. It's interesting to me that twice he says that. Yahweh, Yahweh, I, <laughs> I am always with you. I am always with you. It's amazing to me when this whole thing that's about this love of God is right after he gives the law. Understand, God's the law of God. It's not to pin you down. It's out of love. So it says the Lord, Yahweh, it's a personal theme or a personal name. The next one is God. El is the Hebrew word for that. It's not a name, but this is a title. So we have a name. He gives a personal name, Yahweh, and El. El meaning a, 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 a title, literally meaning almighty, supreme ruler. Almighty, supreme ruler. So we have, I am always with you. I am always with you, never away from you. The almighty, supreme ruler. When we, when we put this out, you can put this out into quite a paragraph of what it really means. He says, Almighty, Supreme Ruler, God, El, is merciful. Merciful, the, the word there for merciful is Rehum. Rehum means compassion. Compassionate. Hebrew, the Hebrew word is derived from the same word, that means mother's womb. So we have an almighty supreme ruler and a motherly love. Compassionate. See, God is everything. He is neither male nor female. But he is everything you need. He's everything you need. Right here in this, um, this, this implication of this, we, we go from heavy masculinity to a motherly compassion. God is neither male nor female, but God has the full attributes of both father and mother, both man and woman. Genesis 1.27 says this, so God created human beings. He created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Male and female are in his image. You see that? <laughs> um, marriage. I mean, just catch this. In the image of God, we are created them. Male and female, he created them. Marriage between a man and a woman combines God's attributes. And the Bible says we become one flesh. Because man and woman together make up more of what God is. My, I can tell you, my kids, mom is different, dad is different. But having both of them together is a completeness. There's a completeness there. It, it's not, and just, uh, I will go back to this a number of times because of where our world is going. But this is why man and man or woman and woman doesn't work. Because it's against how God created us. Do you understand? Men, men have a learning curve when it comes to kids. 
women have this just nature about them that they are born with. Um, I remember when um, we were, when our children were on their way. And we're going through all the different things. Claire, the oldest, comes first. Christy was connected to Claire before Claire was physically before us. Mothers, do you understand what I'm talking about? You were connected. Men, we were connected by, okay, how are we going to have to change our finances? What's going to happen here? How I got to do this? Our connection was a process. Does it men understand what I'm saying? It was a process because we're planners and we're, we're trying to work it out and make sure because we were supposed to be providers, right guys? So it took a little bit longer. See, there's a difference between the man and the woman. doesn't mean that the woman. Christy handled all kinds of other stuff, the paperwork and all the, she, she was the details. But everything changed, men, the first time you held that child. The first time that I held Claire, they put her in my arms, and it's every other kid is screaming and squalling, and she just put her head on my shoulder. Everything changed when I held her. See, men and women, Christy had already, Christy had already connected. Christy was already there. I called up that moment right there. Pastor Brad, you're going to go through this one day. <laughs> you're already, because we, we have talks all the time, you're already processing how to do everything. It's typical. That's what men do. But God, God is your provider. And He is compassionate. He's connected with you. Before you turned around and laid your head on his shoulder. And he's there waiting for you. He's provided everything. See, God covers it all. Isn't that cool? So we see that in the scripture. This is how God is telling you who he is. I'm Lord, Lord. God, I am El. I am supreme ruler. I am Merciful, I'm compassionate, just like a, from, the, from a mother's womb. This is not Moses' idea of who God is. This is God saying, this is what you can get from me. This is who I am. Moses, go share it. Go to the next one. The word gracious comes next. The Lord, Lord God, merciful and gracious. Gracious is from the word Hanun, or it might be Hanun, I can't remember, but Hanun. Unmerited favor, that right there, unconditional love. There is no condition of what you have to do to earn his love. Right now, God loves you, and he loves the terrorist who was planning to take people's lives, he loves them the same and is weeping. Jesus wept. He is saying, turn around and come back to me, my creation, my child. Don't be deceived by the enemy anymore. He loves you. Wherever you're at, one night and you're just like, oh, I'm so far away, God will never. God is still saying, child, I'm right here. I'm merciful. This is God saying who he is. He's gracious. He loves us. He loves us with sin. He loves us without sin. He loves us when we are godly, and he loves us when we are not godly. His love never stops for you. His love never stops for you. It means he blesses because it is in his nature to bless. What is the first thing God does after creating man and woman? First thing he does, he created male and female, and he blessed them. 
and called them human. The very first thing that happens to us, God blesses us. Blesses us. The next word we see in God's given who he is is the word long-suffering. Long-suffering. So, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, long-suffering, the word arak. It means patient. I love this, I love this Hebrew definition, this word. Slow to flare his nostrils. Slow to flare his nostrils. Anybody get what that means? See, I have a mother-in-law that she just never says much. She's, she's just quiet all the time. But you can see if you watch her and something happens, she'll just and just turn her head. And that little no, that nose just flares up. That nostril flares up a little bit. And you know she's not going to say anything. But, see, God is even slow to even flare his nostril at you. He's just waiting for you to turn around. And accept the grace, his son, the blood of Jesus, and be free. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He's gracious. Then you also have that the Rex word it says is he is abundant. It says in abundant in goodness and in truth, he's abundant. He is rob, meaning great. He is great. He is goodness, has said, loving kindness, truth, and meth, certainty, stability. That means it is great loving kindness and stability. Great loving kindness and stability. So we look through this, that word goodness, the has said. I love when you read the definition of this, that loving kindness. Hesed is also, um, it, it is the Hebrew word for stork. How many of you guys know what a stork? What do they represent? Birth, right? Caregiver, wouldn't you say that? Stork, they, they, they've, they've always, you see the stork with the little, I have no idea how the stork ties the little handkerchief thing and, and holds the baby, but the blanket, but he does and in the pictures. And the snork, the snork, that's it, the stork. Stork is the caregiver. Storks are one of the only monogamous animals. They are the international symbol of caregivers for babies, male and female. Listen to this. It's amazing that God uses this word and the Hebrew word for stork is the same, hesed, goodness. We talked about how he's father and mother, right? Male and female Storks take turns sitting on the egg. They both pluck out their own feathers from their stomach to make the nest as soft as possible. And they are known to never leave their children. Even when attacked by larger prey and have been found after forest fires huddled over their children. A burned carcass, but their children are alive and well. That is a word God uses. This is what you can expect from me. A sad goodness, loving kindness. Then, of course, truth, amed, certainty, stability. How many of you want stability? Stability. Verse 7. Verse 7 starts with this. It says, keeping mercy for thousands. Mercy, the word is kesed, meaning kindness. He keeps mercy for thousands. Kindness for thousands. For, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I, I love that word forgiving. The Hebrew word for forgiving is nasa. And the word means to lift off. Isn't that crazy? It means to lift off, to carry away. So you can picture this. When you say, Lord, forgive me my sins, it's like your sins go on a space shuttle and they're gone.
but the Hebrew word, NASA. I can't make that up. To carry away, to lift off. And then it says this, which is very interesting to me. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Now, normally that would be iniquity, comma, transgression, because, you know, you don't put ands over and over again. But God is showing you something. And what's really interesting to me is, why not just say sin? Why are there three things listed here? Iniquity, transgression, and sin. So let's look and see what are these three things. What's the difference between them? Iniquity is ovon. It means mischief, perversity, fleshly, human desires. Even after you're saved, how many of you still have iniquity in your life? That's why we, we daily, Lord, forgive me. If there's anything that stands between me and you, Lord, take it away from me. Any thought that I had. Not terrible thoughts. Get your minds out of the gutter. Just simple greed, jealousy. How about driving in traffic on Friday afternoon? <laughs> you were Facebooking about it. <laughs> it was terrible. There was a horrible wreck, though. That's why I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I'll, I'll, we'll put a school sticker on, but I don't really want to do church stickers because I'm afraid of what I might do when I'm in my car. And then they'll go, oh, it's that church. Um, so, iniquity. Those are mischief, perversity, fleshly human desires. But then it says transgression. Transgression is pesha. You break God's law. He's just given the law and he's putting it there. Transgression is when you, I lay it out for you and you break the law. See, we naturally have iniquity. But transgression is going exactly against the law. We make a transgression. Then it says sin. Hat to all. It's an offense, conscious decision to go against God. When I was a kid, I can remember my dad, he would, um, he would say to me about, uh, you know, hey, when we get home, especially I hated it because it would happen like in church, and then we'd go do something, and I would try to be the best kid I could the rest of the day because he would, he would catch me doing something and say, you're going to spank it when you get home today. And I had to think about it all day, and I would, like, be the best kid I possibly could be. I'd open my door, my, the door for my mom. I would do everything I could. But he would still come to me at the end of the day and say, you know what? All right, Edwin, it's, um, I made you a promise. And if I don't keep that promise, that would make me a liar. No, it's okay, really. <laughs> I'm not going to hold that against you. But he'd say, no, nope, I've got to do this. And he said, there's a reason I'm going to do this. Because you knew better. You willfully disobeyed me. You knew when we go to church, you don't do this. But you willfully disobeyed me. See, sin is when we willfully disobey. The Holy Spirit gives us a Holy Spirit conviction. And we know times I shouldn't do that. But we do it anyway. Because we willfully do it. And that's sin. I used to hate that talk. You willfully disobeyed me. But, as we look at this, as you willfully disobey. So we have three different types of sin, don't we? There's sin, iniquity, transgression. It's amazing to me that God gives each one of those. And then he says this. The next thing he says is about clearing the guilty. He says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He's saying, I forgive all three. I forgive all three. 
And that will by no means clear the guilty. Clearing the guilty, those who have not sought forgiveness, those who are unrepentant. If you never turn to me, I can't just say, come on in. Welcome home. I can't. You've chosen this. Those who are unrepentant, those who have turned away from him completely, denounced him. Do you see that? There's a big difference there, isn't there? He says, I cannot clear the guilty. And then he says this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and upon the third and to the fourth generation. The word visiting. It's the word pakad. Pakad means to visit, means to oversee, and to care for. To visit, to oversee, to care for. Other translations don't really use the word visiting, the iniquity. Go ahead and show me that next slide. Different versions use different words. The Hebrew linear says visiting the iniquity. The NIV says he punishes the children. Some versions of it say he curses. And this is where we get that um, generational curses. And that's a, a big teaching, generational curses. He says, I lay the sin of the parents. That's the NLT. And see, I don't, I'm not trying to pick apart your Bible because the NLT is like one of my favorite Bibles to read. I don't like this translation in this part. I don't like the way they translate this because it doesn't match what the Hebrew word says. I want to go with what the Hebrew word says. So look at some other ones. New King James, visiting the iniquity. I don't have it up there, but King James says visiting the iniquity. The Amplified says visiting the iniquity. The Holman, I can't remember what the C means. Um, but the study Bible, the Holman study Bible, bringing the consequences. And then you got um, the uh, new revised standard version, visiting the iniquity. The Hebrew word says that that word there means visit. The word pakad. Pakad means to visit. Um, visiting in the uh, Old Testament, um, Eleazar. Eliezer was the servant of Abraham, and before Abraham had children, Eliezer was going to receive everything from Abraham. Eliezer was the one who was the overseer. He was the one who cared for. When it was time for Isaac to find a bride, he's the one who goes with a camel filled with gifts to go and find. He finds Rebekah. He was a one who watched over, protected. The word there that you see that, go back one slide if you can. Can you do that for me? I'm going to throw you off. Sorry about that. Visiting, oversee, to care for. That word, pakad, um, today um, in Israel, an Israeli soldier is called a paguda. Paguda comes from the word pakad. It means that they care for, they oversee, to visit. That word is very important in this scripture because instead we see others use, he curses the sin. That's a really big difference from visiting the iniquity to curses the sin. That's a huge difference. Why the word iniquity? In the Old Testament, there were transgression offerings and there were sin offerings. There were sin sacrifices and there were transgression sacrifices. But there was not an iniquity sacrifice. And he says, my son's coming. And his blood is going to wash away. And it's going to be there to forgive just even your human desires. The iniquity. The iniquity. Remember iniquity is human, fleshly desires, mischief. We battle against it even after we're saved. We battle against it all our lives. If a father never turns to God, if a mother never turns to God, 
they have iniquity. There's patterns. Those patterns follow those generations. The word curse is not there. It's not that he curses the generations. It says that he visits the iniquity. He visits the iniquity. If you have a father, have you seen it? You have a father who was an alcoholic and abused his children, and those children say, I'll never be like that. But then if they, if God has not entered their life, what are they going to become one day? We always see it. They become the same thing their father was. But God says, I visit the iniquities. I visit, I visit your children. I visit your grandchildren. I don't stop coming. I keep going after because they're my creation. They're my children. I'm never going to stop. I visit. I thank God for the pattern that my father set for me. See, my father set a pattern for me to follow Christ and to serve. Not everybody has that pattern before them. I have a pattern that that I remember when my father was a a manager for, for a major grocery chain and his supervisors would come in and they would have parties where they would go out and they would get drunk and my dad would not attend those. He was kind of the, put on the outside Oh, that's that Christian. And many times my father thought about quitting the job because of the way he was treated at times. And see, that's not exactly the way that company treated people. It was just how certain people understand. It's not how God treats you, but certain people will do things to you. Some people walk into a church, and they walk into a church and they say, oh, these people just made me, they, they were hypocrites, they were this. Well, that, those are people. That's not God. God loves you. God is merciful, compassionate. God visits you and comes after you. He will never stop visiting you. Never. I remember when my dad, all that time, as, to see an example for me, my father most of y'all know I've talked about him many times my father was a manager for Publix supermarkets for years 40 something years he worked for the company the owner of Publix supermarkets his name was George Jenkins he was the founder he was the Walt Disney of grocery stores he had this green jacket that had little Publix's Publix symbols all over it specially made for him he even looked like Walt Disney and Back in the, in the days when I was very young, Publix was obviously not as big as it is now. And there were times where there was stuff where I was there with Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins was a man who ran his company. Publix was not open on Sundays. They were very much like Chick-fil-A. He said that that Sundays are days for my employees. That's days for them to spend with their family and to worship God. There was a commercial about it in Florida. I remember a commercial where a manager's locking up the store. They say, we lock up on Saturdays. We'll see you again on Monday. Because at Publix, we worship God on Sunday, and we spend days with our families. Later, when Jenkins passed away and others came in and took over, they saw how much money, well, we can make more money if we open on Sundays. But I remember all that time where my dad would get kind of put on the outside. He would be put as that one who, um, who, he's that Christian. We don't really want to involve him in this. Don't want to have him in this. I remember my dad got a phone call at a store one day, and it was George Jenkins. And he said, my daughter, stepdaughter, is going to be moving here from Italy, and she's going to be going to University of Tampa. He said, I don't want her to live her freshman year on campus, come into a new country. Just, I don't want her to be there, the things that could happen. He said, Jack, I know that you are a Christian man. Remember, he was put aside because he was a Christian. And then the owner of the company says, because you're a Christian, I want to ask you if my daughter, my stepdaughter can live with you guys and go to college her freshman year. So that whole freshman year, his stepdaughter lived in our home. Those guys that partied all the time and did those things and were unkind. See, God has a way of taking care of his people. 
My dad got promotion after promotion after promotion. Why? Because no matter what was going on, he kept God first. And see, that as a young man, that, told, that spoke volumes to me. Because for a little while there, I was like, okay, what good is it to be this Christian? You're getting put on side. And then I see something like that. See, he set a pattern for me. Not everybody had that pattern. Maybe the pattern was, was your mom and your father, your parents, maybe they weren't followers of Christ. But today you're sitting here. And you know why you're sitting here? Because he visited you. He visited you. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, well, I have kids and I don't know what to do. You know what? He's going to visit them. Because his word says he visits the iniquity. From every generation, from your children to your grandchildren to your great-grandchildren, he doesn't stop. He visits the iniquity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. His love for you is so great. His love for you. Some scriptures say that this is a curse. It's not a curse. It's a visitation. It's a visitation. And this scripture, like I said, is not about a curse, but a visit. God's promise to visit the children and draw them to him. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Because of him, because of God visiting you, because he sent his son for you. I'm the greatest, the greatest visit of all time. I'm sending my son, and he's changing history. Matter of fact, the world's going to change. They're going to set a new time, a new calendar based on him. Everything changed because of Jesus. Jesus was the living, walking epitome of who God just told us he is. Right here, fleshly, right in front of you. Today you're free. Today you are free because he never stopped visiting you. Maybe today you say, you know what? I'm tired of the iniquity. And God, I invite you in even more. I want to stop it. 